America shall be saved. Why don't you say that with me? America shall be saved. You know, say it again. America shall be saved. One more time. America shall be saved. Ooh. Ooh. Turn to your neighbor and tell them to put on their seatbelt. For some, it's already too late. You know, before we uh, get into the word, um, <clears throat> why don't you stand? We'll, we'll just do it. You've been sitting for so long, at least two minutes. This is the home of Christian aerobics. When Jesus said, walk and pray, we felt he was serious. So we, we keep you on your feet, you know. Or was that watch and pray? Oh, it was watch and pray. Never mind. Um, how many of you have uh, family members that just need to get right with God? They just need to get right with God. Man, it looks like just about everybody. In fact, put your hands down. Is there anyone who would say, you know, I can't think of one family member that doesn't. I'm, I'm serious. If there, we got one back here. That's awesome. We just have you guys pray for all of us. See? <laughs> I, you know, there's just, uh, there's this anointing for evangelism, uh, not just altar calls, actually uh, a spirit a spirit of evangelism. Chris just really released, and, and uh, largely the women got whacked with that one. And, uh, and I, I, it makes me a little bit nervous in a real good way. And uh, yeah, yeah, just some of the powerful, powerful ministries of, in history have been women who laid their life down. So here's what we're going to do. Um, you know what? Find out. Find the name of at least one person that needs to get right with God from the person on your right, the person on your left. Do that quickly, then we're going to pray together. Just, just give them a name. At least one. Okay, you should have you should have the entire family history by now. Okay, let's, we're going to do this. I like to do uh, symbolic or what we call prophetic acts. Prophetic acts have the power of prophecy, but they're natural acts that have no n natural correlation to the answer. Like when uh, the prophet threw a stick in the water and an axe head swim. Swam. It was a prophetic act of obedience, but God responded and accomplished the impossible. I want you to take your hands as though you're bringing people before the Lord. And I want you to bring at least one of the individuals in your heart and one of, of your neighbors. I want you to bring them, literally bring them before the Lord, lift them before the Lord. Say, Lord, I bring these to you. I declare forgiveness over them, draw them to you. Now I want you to pray for them. Just lift your voices and pray. Please do not pray quietly in your heart. Let's pray evangelistic prayers. God, we join their name with the name Jesus right now. We join the name of John with the name Jesus right now. Sally, Brian to the name Jesus. Julie to the name Jesus. Draw them near God. Draw them near. Draw them near. We bring them to you. We lift them before you, God. We bring them before you, God. Save these friends, these family members. Save them, Lord. 
Jesus at one point said, whoever you forgive, I forgive. So I want you to declare your forgiveness over these individuals. Just declare it, no matter how bad they've messed up, we hold nothing against them. We declare the forgiveness of our own heart and the forgiveness of the Lord over these people right now in Jesus' mighty name. Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen, all right, well why don't you hug a few necks and be seated. Just go and be seated, hug, hug, hug somebody, you know. Ever since I was a child, I've always had a fear of someone under my bed at night. So I went to a psychiatrist and told him, I've got problems. Every time I go to bed, I think there's someone under it. I'm scared. I think I'm going crazy. He responded, just put yourself in my hands for one year, said the shrink. Come talk to me three times a week. We should be able to get rid of those fears. How much do you charge, he asked. $80 per visit, replied the doctor. I'll sleep on it, he said. <laughs> I said. Six months later, the doctor met me on the street. He asked, why didn't you come to see me about those fears you were having? I responded, well, 80 bucks a visit, three times a week for a year is over $12,000. My neighbor cured me for free. I was so happy to have saved all that money, I went and bought me a new pickup truck. Is that so, the psychiatrist responded. With a bit of an attitude, he said, and how, may I ask, did your neighbor cure you? I replied, he told me to cut the legs off the bed. Ain't nobody under there now. Goodness. All right. All right. <laughs> Several weeks ago, I, I, um, during a message, I, I took a little detour for a few minutes and talked to you about the high price of prayerlessness. And of course, I would never mean this to be a shameful message or uh, some you know, some harsh exhortation, but instead an appeal uh, that we could live sober-minded and realize Jesus gives this overall commission and command, and it has to do with the relationship with him. And it's the invitation to pray at all times, pray without ceasing. I personally like to think that the pray without ceasing is the substance of prayer, and the hour or whatever you take is the icing on the cake. The real substance of prayer is the fact that it is continuous fellowship with God. And prayerlessness has effects on our lives that is, uh, is very, very sobering. So what I want you to do is I'm gonna, I've got six stories I wanna tell you. I'm not sure if I have time for all of them, but there are six passages that we'll read. And if we don't, I'll just do it another time. So but let's go ahead and start with the first one. I want you to go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. This, we're going to read a portion where Jesus is praying in the garden. And this is where his sweat became as drops of blood on his head. The anguish, his own prayer, uh, prayer time, was physically having an effect on him where sweat became blood. I don't think it was a water to wine type thing. I think it was actually um, such pressure was on him in prayer that he physically manifested blood as sweat on his forehead. Right before this, Jesus and the disciples had a conversation. 
And in this conversation, Jesus announced to them that they were all going to fall away. And Peter made, of course, the statement, they, they, they might, but I won't. And then Jesus said, as a matter of fact, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And this is the prayer meeting that followed that warning that Jesus gave him. So if you look at this with me, let's go right to verse 33. We're going to jump, jump in the middle of the story um, because of how much we have to read tonight. Verse 43, then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. That is a stunning uh, moment to me in Peter's life in that Jesus announced to him that he was about to deny him. And yet he gave him access to a strength where Jesus would have been wrong. He invited him into a time of prayer where had he had pursued, he never would have entered into temptation. Temptation is an interesting thing because God never puts us in a position to be tempted. The real issue of temptation is that it's the individual's heart that translates a circumstance and makes it a temptation. An illustration that I give uh, fairly often is let's just say Brian and I are going to a lunch and let's just say uh, he's doing real good with the Lord, doing well, his finances are just in order, he's just living in a great victory and I'm living in great fear. I just, I just am having a hard time, I'm afraid, I'm not gonna be able to pay my bills. I've got this anxiety fear thing going on. So we sit down at the restaurant and right next to the salt and pepper shaker is a hundred dollar bill folded up. But the waitress doesn't see it when she uh, cleans the table. And Brian excuses himself, wants to go wash the fellowship off of his hands before we have, uh, have a meal together. And uh, when he goes, I spot the hundred dollar bill and it crosses my mind. I could take that because she doesn't even know it's there. And then I resist the temptation. I go, man, that's just totally wrong. What am I thinking? I repent for even having the thought. I don't take it. Brian comes and sits down. He notices the $100 bill. He calls out the waitress by name. He says, Andy, look, somebody gave you a really good tip. It never crossed his mind. Now, neither of us took the money, but one of us was tempted. Heart condition turned a circumstance and made it a temptation. There are certain, it's, it's almost like doors uh, on a stage. There are circumstances in life and what prayerfulness does is it gives you a discernment on the nature of the door. You don't even fall into the situation. You don't even come to where you would be exposed in your weak place because prayerfulness, prayerfulness has heightened your awareness of what's behind the door. Without the prayerfulness, you may open the door, you may fall into a temptation, and you may successfully, hopefully, resist the temptation. But the point is, is you want to go through life, you, you, you don't want to face things for which you have no grace. It doesn't mean you can't muster up the strength to say no to that temptation. Of course you can. We all have a will and we can choose. But what's tragic is some people, because of prayerlessness, live in a battle with circumstances they never should have had to face. It, 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 um, it, depl it deplenishes, is that the right word? Deplenishes. It robs of strength. It robs of creativity. It robs of natural, healthy, authentic expression of who we are because we're having to constantly fight battles we were never designed to fight. So he said, pray that you wouldn't enter. You wouldn't even go through the doorway of what would be appealing to you at some weak place in your own life. I 
I remember years ago, Paul Manwaring was, he, he used to be a, uh, used to run a prison in the UK and a highly decorated uh, prison warden. And I remember what he would do when he was working with the prisoner is, is he would remind himself that he had the same potential to be where they're at that they had. And he would remind them they had the same potential to be where he was. It's all grace. And what prayerfulness does is it makes us aware of unseen things that are actually more real than what is visible. We're not talking about a land of make-believe. We're not talking about the power of suggestion and just getting us psyched up so that we don't fall into sin. It's not that at all. It's that we're actually drawing upon a strength that is superior to everything else we could possibly muster up. And prayerfulness unclutters the eyes to see what is real. Turn uh, in your Bibles to the book of uh, Matthew, chapter 44. This one is, um, is really stunning to me. Matthew, chapter 5. You guys all still alive? That's good. I hate when people die in the meeting. It's just a, <laughs> so depressing. Matthew chapter 5, I have an interesting verse here <clears throat> in verse 43. I want you to look at it with me. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Let's take that last phrase. Pray for those who persecute you, spitefully use you. Pray for them, not against them. Pray for them so that you will be a son and or daughter of God. Now, are you thinking? There's an exhortation to pray. I don't believe he's saying, pray for those who oppose you and then you'll be born again. We become sons and daughters of God in our faith in Christ. That's what causes us to be born again. What he's declaring over us is that when you pray, when you exercise your right to come before the almighty God and you actually use it to pray on behalf of someone who has opposed you, you're praying for, not against. When you do that, it becomes clear to you and to the entire spirit realm that you are a child of God. It becomes manifested. Why? Because you're using your authority to come before a perfect father and you're using it to actually pray for someone, on behalf, positively, for someone who has opposed you. Your identity in Christ becomes manifest. This is interesting because uh, we don't have time for it tonight, but this will trigger something in some of you. You remember in Romans 8, it says that all of creation groans. That's creation praying. All creation groans, travailing, waiting for the sons and daughters of God to be manifested. What is this saying? When you pray for those who have opposed you, you pray for those who others would consider to be your enemy, and you pray for their blessing. You pray for their welfare. You pray as the perfect father would pray. Then your identity becomes established, firm, and revealed. See, there are certain things that are being withheld of the purposes of God in the earth, and they're being withheld as they will only be released to a people that have become manifested as the sons and daughters of God. It is essential that we step into identity, and one of the clearest ways is to pray for those who are opposed to you. There are realms in God. There are realms in <clears throat> in manifestation of presence and kingdom, of power. There are realms in God that he has withheld 
only willing to release them upon a people manifested as sons and daughters of God. So what does this do? It causes the domino effect. It positions us correctly as identified from heaven. You say, well, I was identified when you were born again. He said, do this so that you'll be identified as a son, as a daughter of God. Something happens in the unseen realm that doesn't happen another way. <clears throat> Some of you were here when I've, I've done uh, teaching on communion. <clears throat> Benny and I like to take communion every day, it's, which means it's most every day. And uh, sometimes we do it together, sometimes we do it individually. I take supplies with me when I travel on the road. And I was just in Indonesia last week and would take communion before the Lord. And there are a number of things that I do, and I, I won't take a long time uh, to mention this, but when I hold the bread, I make confession by his stripes, I was healed. And I pray for those who need the miracle because the payment is in my hand. It's the torn flesh of Jesus that was torn in the beating that he suffered. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. Is what the scripture says. Benny, actually, somebody, a friend of hers was dying, had seven different diseases. And uh, she was in the hospital and she wrote Benny and Benny wrote her back a text or email and said, take communion every day and gave her some instruction. And within, I don't know how long, I think it was within a month, all seven diseases were gone. She was completely healed. There's something about coming before the Lord with what he paid for you and for me. So by his stripes, I was healed. But when I take the cup, I pray over every family member. I pray for uh, my son, Eric, and his wife, Candace, for Kennedy and Selah. I pray for Brian and Jen and Haley and Taya, Braden, Moses. I pray for Gabe and Leah, my, my daughter and son-in-law. And I pray for their four kids, Judah, Diego, Bella, and Cruz. And I pray over them each by name. And I pray that prayer out of Jeremiah 24 that I actually started praying for my children before I found it was in the Bible. When I found it, it was in the Bible, I thought, it's legal. It's a legal prayer. I got so happy. <clears throat> and I, I've been praying for them since they were very, very little children. God, give them a heart to know you. It's in Jeremiah 24. So I pray that over every family member. I pray that God would help them to know his ways, that he would, they would hear his voice. Each one, God has no grandchildren. Each one needs to be summoned by the Father to himself. And so I pray into that, God, let them hear and know your voice to be summoned to you. When I'm through praying for my family, which I just, I enjoy so much, just, in fact, what I do is I make confession. As I make a confession, by his stripes we are healed. When I hold the blood before the Lord, I make the confession. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Every single family member, we will serve you with purity, with power. We will do so with passion and great zeal. We will withhold nothing from you. It's the great privilege of prayer. But as soon as I'm through praying for my family, I, I pray for three people that are international and two that are not international who have taken a position to oppose me as an individual, to write against me, to hold conferences against me, and to do videos and write books, that sort of thing. And I bring their name to the Lord. You see, what they're doing takes great zeal and great courage. Do I think they're accurate? No, of course I don't. But they are offering something to, to the Lord out of an offering of great courage and great risk. They suffer for their decision. I don't support the decision, but I support them. And so what I do is I bring their names before the Lord. And I ask the Lord, please cause them to prosper, spirit, soul, and body. Cause them, and this is my, the big thing I pray for, is cause these men, cause them, all of their children and all of their grandchildren to serve you with great zeal and great joy. I want them to know the pleasure of having children that serve God and grandchildren. I don't want any of them to fall away. <clears throat> I don't want any of them to become complacent or cold-hearted. And so I bring them before the Lord. See, this is what Jesus said. He said, when you pray for those who spitefully use you, when you pray for, on behalf of, in support of those who persecute you, you are a son. Yeah. 
What else is there? Okay, I'm going to be a son today. I was before I prayed. But something becomes pronounced and manifest when I begin to pray out of earnestness of my heart. God, cause these people to prosper. Bless them. I don't pray that God would change their minds. I don't pray, oh God, expose the error of their way. I don't pray any of those things. You never criticize a servant to its master. Proverbs warns against criticizing a servant to its master. That is forbidden territory. They are not my servant. We had situations go on here at Bethel many, many, many years ago and here in Reading. And people would come to me. They'd say, well, what do you think about this? And I would tell them, no one can force me to have an opinion. I am unwilling to take mental energy and put it into a situation for which I have no responsibility. You do not criticize a servant to their master. And so Jesus reveals in this passage one of the greatest things that we need right now. How many believers are there in the world? It's an extraordinary number of hundreds of millions. I wonder what would happen to their posture before kings if they simply gave themselves to pray for those who oppose them. So go to the book of James. <laughs> you all right? Yep, me too. Me too. A little messed up, but I was messed up when I got up here. So Chris O didn't help at all with that one. We, we, we got a little, little wreck down there in the front row, and second row, third row. How many of you in the back row got a little messed up too? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Turn in your Bibles to the book of James. And we're going to look at just one phrase out of one verse. Um, uh, and, and the reason, the whole verse, the whole chapter, obviously, is always worth studying. But I'm wanting to take a phrase because that, I, I don't want to be distracted by the rest. So hopefully that'll make sense to you. We can take verse 2. You lust and do not have chapter 4, James 4, verse 2. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot contain, obtain. You fight and war. <clears throat> And here it is. You do not have because you do not ask. Say this with me. You do not have because you do not ask. Say it with me now. You do not have because you do not ask. Say it again. You do not have because you do not ask. Prayerlessness creates lack. Prayerlessness fuels lack. Prayerlessness is, is what um, prayerlessness is what lack wants to consume. When we face a need and there's prayerlessness, it actually fuels lack instead of causes it to be solved and disappear. You have not because you ask not. So prayerlessness actually sustains need and lack. Many people walk around waiting for God to do something. And what I've been finding out, and I'm a slow, and I do mean slow learner. I've been finding out most of the time he's waiting for me to do something. I mean, how many understand we're not talking about uh, as you thank God for the meal. God, thank you for the meal um, and provide for us today. Amen. I'm not saying that prayer doesn't work. But if you've got a big need, you might want to dig in a bit. You might want to dig in a bit. Let the weightiness of what you're facing determine the weightiness of how you pray. Casual prayers get casual answers. If, if you are willing to live off of token answers, then offer up token prayers. But if you want heaven to move, let your heart be moved. He'll move as far as you move. I'm not saying at all that he can't surpass anything that we do and cry out and lift up. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. But in his effort to raise us as sons and daughters of God that can carry responsibility into the earth, most of the time, 
he looks for earnest response in us to bring forth an earnest response from him. I, I, I hope that doesn't sound like a works thing because I don't see it that way at all. It's just, you know what? When you're on the altar, you can pray earnestly. When you're off the altar, considering the concept of the altar, you pray timidly. I heard recently, when you're on the altar, <laughs> you can pray earnestly. It's when you're off the altar, considering the concept of sacrifice. That's where we pray token prayers. Hey Amen, Bill. That's a really good point. Why don't you? It's too late. Luke chapter 18. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Sorry. I, I have a gift of torment. I just, it's just, it's just what I do. I torment people. I, my love language is teasing. So I, you know, if I didn't tease you, you could walk out of here wondering if I loved you. But, uh, but there should be no question now. Read, uh, Chris read this this morning in, uh, I don't know, one of our services. We only had 800 services this morning. No, no, not quite. He read this this morning. Start uh, with me with verse 1. It's a longer piece. He spoke a parable to them. Men ought to pray and not lose heart. So we're talking about prayer that's not just a petition prayer but it's persistent in its petition. He said, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. There was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. He would not for a while, but afterwards said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wear me out. The Lord said, hear what the unjust set, judge said, and shall, God, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out to him day and night, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man returns, will he really find faith on the earth? This is interesting because we have, on one hand, we, the picture is of a widow that just keeps banging on the door of the judge. And then Jesus uses this illustration for repeated day and night prayer. And then God says, I'm going to answer speedily. He obviously thinks of speedily different than I do. He says, I'm going to answer speedily. And I'm thinking, man, I've been banging on this door for 15 days. You know, when is this thing going to open? He says, I'm going to answer speedily. And he does. There's a tippy point, tipping point in prayer in which the answer is released, and the answer always comes quickly. But to get to that place where things shift sometimes takes persistence. Prayerlessness actually allows circumstances to be um, uh, prayerlessness allows the absence of breakthrough to become the norm. And generally, we come to the conclusion, well, I prayed, and it just, God sovereignly did not answer. So the absence of an answer falls under, under the category that we call the sovereignty of God. And yet Jesus is saying, persistence would have got the breakthrough. So we're talking now uh, not just about a prayer prayed, but a lifestyle of anchoring into something. Now, I mentioned this. I've, I've done this teaching here uh, several years back, and I mentioned it in our conference this week. And let me give you like the two-minute version. <clears throat> Jesus said that we're not to use vain repetition of prayer. In other words, you're not to repeat a prayer over and over again because he knows what you have need of before you ask. In the very next chapter, he says, ask and continue to ask. The language there is a, a, a 
verb that says you do this, but you continue doing it until there's breakthrough. So in two chapters, back to back, one says ask and don't keep on asking. The other one says ask and continue asking. What's the difference? Come back next week and I'll tell you. No. <laughs> What's the difference? When he said, don't repeatedly lift up the prayer for, before me for something, he said, for your father, father knows what you have need of before you ask. This is pertaining to basic needs. For me to say, father, would you provide food for me today? And for me to ask him every five minutes is for me to question that he's actually a father because it violates his nature and his covenant to me as a father who is committed to taking care of my, my needs. The persistence in prayer has to do with how we pray with our dreams. The persistence in prayer, I, I, I'm supposed to pray for what I have need of. God provide for us our, our, our food today. I'm supposed to pray for these things. God, I, I need to buy coats for my kids before winter sets in. I'm supposed to pray for those things. But those are basic human needs. You lift them up, and then you celebrate the fact that you serve a righteous and perfect father. But when it comes to the unfolding of a dream, God, I've got it in my heart to have this business. Oh, God, this thing has been in me for so many years. And you fast, you get before the Lord, you cry out for breakthrough, and you contend for this breakthrough. Why? Because persistence in prayer changes you and changes you to where you become a person that can properly steward the answer that you just prayed for. If he gives us much of what we ask for, when we ask for it, it would kill us. I mean, literally, it would kill us. Why does God discipline his children? It's so that his blessings don't kill us. We ask for oak trees, he gives us acorns. Why? Can you steward the answer in its embryonic form? Because in stewarding, as it grows, I become a different person. My strength increases, my resolve increases, my sense of priorities change. All of a sudden, I have this willingness to pay any price because I can see something happening before my eyes. I change with persistence in prayer. And so this exhortation for persistence in prayer is connected to breakthrough. And where there is not prayer, and especially the prayer of persistence, there's the absence of breakthrough. All right, we're almost done. Isn't that fun? Let's, uh, let's do two more. We'll do uh, Luke 11. Just back up a few chapters. You guys all right? Everybody still all right? I don't know what I would do. Actually, I've had times where I've said, are you all right? And somebody's yelled out, no. <laughs> I wasn't sure what to do. The only thing that works for me is just to ignore them. <laughs> now this, this one is a little bit more abstract, but I, but I, um, if I could teach 20 minutes on this, which I'm not going to do, I'm going to take maybe three or four minutes, five minutes. If I could teach 20 minutes on this, it would make a whole lot more sense. I'm just going to trust that you can work with it if you can't stick it on a shelf and see what happens in the future. Luke 11, verse 24. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. Does anybody remember who the Holy Spirit is inside of us? He's in us as a river in John chapter 7. The enemy's looking for dry places. Those who fail to connect with the flow of presence become a dry place, and it's completely unnecessary. Now, 
you say well, a Christian, uh, I think it was John Wimber that said uh, that why would a Christian want a demon? They make horrible pets. So I, I, don't know, I, I always thought that was a pretty good answer. But I remind you that the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4 warned the church, the most mature church of all the letters received. He warned them, don't give place to the devil. It's not demon possession. It's a place of influence. Which, by the way, in the Old Testament, when the enemies of Israel gained influence in the city, Tobiah, I think it was Tobiah, ended up moving into the temple where they kept the money. If you want to know where the enemy wants to live, in your temple. He wants to live where the generosity lifestyle, and I'm not just talking about offerings and money, I'm talking about the way you look at people, the way you look at human need, the way you look at the power of your words to invest in someone. It's that, it's that seat of generosity that reveals we are like the Father. For God so loved the world that He gave. And the enemy actually moved in, took out all the possessions that were to belong in the temple, and set up residence in this temple. It's crazy. All right, back to verse 24. I said I was going to teach on this for three or four minutes. Make that five or six. All right. Let's try to get through this quickly. When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. Finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. When he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. He goes and he takes with him seven other spirits that are more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. The last state of that man is worse than the first. This is a very fascinating story. It does refer to a human being. But it also, how many remember when the Lord would speak of the house of David? David was a man, but he wasn't talking about his physical house. Right? The house of David, he's talking about the family line, the house of Israel, an entire nation. So there are times where the scripture talks about the house of a man and the implications are much more far reaching than just a human being and possessing his own physical body. Prayerlessness creates vacancy in the heart of the person. This house was clean and swept, and when the owner of the house didn't put furniture in the house, in the place of where the enemy occupied, it was left vacant. I could take you through church history and I can show you were denominations and groups of people that were once powerhouses of the gospel slackened off and ended up with vacant places that the enemy they once opposed came back seven times worse. Groups known for holiness became the seedbed of vast expressions of immorality and ungodliness. The very places occupied. And I don't say that in, as, a, as a criticism or, or uh, somehow to put people down. I'm just saying, listen, this is how the enemy works. And prayerlessness is a vacancy because there's furniture that's supposed to belong there. In the house of my heart, prayer is one of the couches. <laughs> and if I, if I remove the couch, there's a vacant spot. And wherever there's a vacant spot, the enemy wants to fill it. All right, one more. One more, one more. Why don't you go to 1 Samuel chapter 12. Let's get a little Old Testament action in this. We could probably get about 100 things on this list, but I, I had uh, three or four of them written down, and I, I wanted to add a couple today for our, our little talk. 1 Samuel chapter 12. This is kind of a sobering moment with uh, Samuel and Saul. <clears throat> he gives him a warning, verse 21. He says, do not turn aside. Then you'd go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver. They are nothing. The Lord will not forsake his people. 
for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Verse 23, moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Now, I don't know, I've read this verse for, you know, a long time. And it's been one of those that has just stood out to me concerning the responsibility that we have for one another, the responsibility that we have uh, for leaders, etc. But something hit me today when I was looking at this passage. Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't understand it. I'm just, I'm marked by it is all. I, I, I can't teach on it well, but I'm impacted by the fact that he says, it's almost like here's a sinful act against the Lord, but there wasn't a sinful act. There was the stopping of a righteous act. It, it almost looks like he's saying, you know, when you do this witchcraft, you do this, that, this, this junk, that junk, you're sinning against the Lord. But for the prophet who knows what it is to bear responsibility before God, he said it would be a sin against God for him not to pray. I'm just here to encourage you. That's all. <laughs> Prayerfulness is a gift that we can carry throughout the day. I loved blocks of time with refined focus. Don't misunderstand me. It's been a huge part of my life, my goodness, when I was a young man and was single. I mean, both ends of the day with extended periods of time. As a pastor in Weaverville, I remember just walking the city, walking in the woods, walking through the church. I, I walk when I pray because I don't get sleepy when I walk, you know. Yeah. And I'm able to, to get a little bit more militant and aggressive. It's just, it's just better for me. I, I, I can kneel and pray, but I can also snore. Uh, so <laughs> I, sleep is kind of like the kingdom of God. It's at hand. It's always right there. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It's always, it's always ever present. And I, I, I practice falling asleep in the presence. I really do. I practice it. I do. How many of you have pray, you determined to pray and you fell asleep? Uh, I, yeah. How many of you, how many of you felt bad after you fell asleep? Go, man, I just can't seem to stay awake. I, I get that. I, I've done that a lot. But you know, when my kids would fall asleep in my arms, I, I never once got mad at them. I actually held them hoping they would. So there is a spot for the earnestness in prayer. Position yourself physically to remain earnest. And if you're sleepy, get up and walk. I mean, just let's be practical. Get up and walk. If you're not, kneel before the Lord. Do whatever. But when you go to bed at night, remember, you're praying without ceasing. I, used, I don't know if I, if I still do this because I'm, I'm sleeping, but I used to. <clears throat> uh, Brian actually captured the lyrics of Solomon uh, in one of his songs years ago, uh, though I sleep yet my heart is awake. That's significant. Now, we'll, we'll wrap it up with this, but I want you to catch this thought. God appeared to Solomon in a dream. Solomon made a life-altering decision in his sleep. God trusted him in his resolve to the will of God so completely that he allowed Solomon to answer him in his sleep. And Solomon was the one who penned these words, though I sleep, my body is shut down resting, my heart is awake. 
And I, I, uh, I, I used to wake myself up praying. I didn't wake up to pray. I'd be praying while I was sleeping. I t- took a, cri- a trip with Chris years ago. Chris came with me to Colorado to do this uh, YWAM thing. <clears throat> and I would, I would just pray throughout, throughout the night, not knowing and I was sleeping. But my heart was exploding with cries to God. What you want to do is you want to, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have a better day if you have a better night. And you'll have a better night if you engage with him, not over difficult matters. Take care of that while you're wide awake. I made the mistake last night of stirring up difficult matters and lost a bunch of sleep as a result. It doesn't happen much, but it, it, it happened last night. And I just, I just broke one of those rules that I know better on. You, you don't bring up the difficult things in the middle of the night. You know, it'll probably still be there tomorrow. <laughs> so engage with them tomorrow. But the point is, is we have this lifestyle of continuous fellowship with him. Ongoing prayer. Pray without ceasing. And that is the luxury of this relationship is that I live before him in heavenly places before a perfect father who hears me. I don't think you have to have long prayers to get big answers, but I do think you have to have earnest prayers to get big answers. If you study the book of Nehemiah, you'll find a series of prayers that he prayed that were only one sentence long. The prayers of Nehemiah, just look at the prayers of Nehemiah, one sentence long. But when you're dug into an issue and this request is not just a passive thing to ease your conscience that you have now prayed, but you've actually dug in regarding a matter and you lift up that prayer. There are times where one sentence brings the breakthrough. So we don't earn breakthroughs in the sense of I've got to pray for this one thing for five hours, then I know there'll be a breakthrough. I had a friend that he, he was uh, just contending with the Lord over something. He said, he said I'm just going gonna, just gonna, gonna to spend the entire night before the Lord praying for this matter. As soon as he knelt down, the Lord answered it and just kind of ruined his whole <laughs> night. And he was so shocked. But you know, that's what you do. You dig in. And if he brings it quick, then you say thank you. Thank you so much. I would have just I'd rather have slept. So this is great news. I will now sleep. <clears throat> but here's this issue of failing. This is scripture. So I, I want to be careful that I don't trigger the wrong message in you. But if I've been given an assignment to pray and I don't, it's as though I did something against God. The absence, the withdrawing from an assignment is an aggressive posture against. So, why don't you stand, let's pray. I, we used to, in Weaverville, we used to do prayer meetings a lot. I, we had them for years, six every morning, or five, I think five days a week. And then every Friday night, we started with this prayer meeting. We started at 11 at night because I, I wanted people to have time with their families. I just wanted them to miss sleep, not family time. <laughs> just this hardcore, in-your-face kind of prayer stuff. And there were times there was a number of folks there, and for a number of years, there were times where nobody showed up. I remember Chris one time, he led the prayer meeting for me. I was out of town, and nobody showed up for that particular week. So he took the microphone, and he was just praying loudly. All these, he's the only one in the room, but he's going for it, you know, as though there was a crowd of thousands. I love that. And I, I love the corporate prayer gathering. I, I hope, I'm hoping our schedules are so challenging. 
Our use of facilities is so challenging. I'm hoping at some point we can have a facility that's just for corporate prayer gatherings. It's, if, if, you, if you saw, we have 100 events a year here, constant demand on every room in the building. And it's just one of the greatest challenges. And what frustrates me is one of the greatest cries in my heart is the corporate prayer meeting. I, I love agreement and prayer. I guess what I'd like to see all of us take home is just this increased mantle for prayer. There was actually, there's actually one particular so I see if I can find this. There's one particular part of this story I did forget one. I'll just mention it to you quickly because it's, it's just bizarre. This is Old Testament as well. I, I knew there was one to do with the presence. It's a, it's a strange thing. It's this one phrase is mentioned maybe seven or eight times in one chapter. And it was this whole deal. They had built a, the Temple of Solomon and the Lord was instructing people, listen, when you, when you get into a battle, when you get into a conflict, when you get into this situation or that, pray towards this house. And that, that phrase, toward this house, pray. And we don't pray towards buildings. And the Lord himself would say, there isn't a building you can make that I could inhabit, you know, completely. And yet he created this, this system of thought where people would actually face Jerusalem and pray towards Jerusalem. Why? Not as a religious ritual. Why? Not because it's a certain, uh, you know, it's east. It's, it's, it has a certain direction, a geographical direction. It's because God was there. The point is, prayerlessness accentuates the absence of the awareness of the presence of God. Prayerfulness heightens our awareness of presence. It's not just praying for the big things. It's the continuous fellowship. It's that keeps me connected to presence, ongoing presence, so that when an urgent thing comes up, we're there. We're instant in season, in season and out. I remember back in the 70s, this guy was, was telling us um, his upstairs uh, bathroom, uh, it took forever to get hot water because the hot water was at the other end of the house. And, and it would, he would just have to you know, all this water would go through, just trying to wait for hot water to come. And so he said, I found out that if I turned it on just a little tiny bit at night before I went to bed, it would just, just slowly drip and it would keep hot water ready so that when I got up the next morning, I would turn it on instantly hot water. That's what praying in tongues throughout your day does. That's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what praying in tongue does. That's what praying ongoing throughout your day just keeps you connected to ever-present hot water. I'm ready to act now. All right, why don't you grab a hand? We're going to pray. We're going to pray for the prayerfulness, the prayerfulness of Christ to be restored to us as people. The prayerfulness of Christ to be restored to us as people. Tell him what you want. Ask him to do it to you, for you. I'm going to pray over you in a moment, but you pray right now. For yourself, pray for the ones on your right and left. Pray. Prayerfulness. Prayerfulness. The prayerfulness of Jesus, the prayerfulness of Christ, the ongoing awareness of presence, the ongoing awareness of the person of the Holy Spirit. Expand us, God, in this next season, that there be dramatic increase and expansion in our awareness of your presence, of your heartbeat.
Declare over the one on your right and left, prayerfulness. Just declare, the prayerfulness of Christ is upon you. The prayerfulness of Christ, say it with authority. The prayerfulness of Christ is upon you. The prayerfulness of Christ is upon you. The prayerfulness of Christ is upon you. Now, just hold your hands before the Lord. I'm going to pray for you and we'll end this. Father, I do ask that you would release as a gift over every person. You know what, folks? I've never prayed for this in my life. The prayerfulness of Christ. There's something in that phrase that's supposed to take us into this next season. Lord, I do pray. The prayerfulness of Christ. The unbroken fellowship throughout the day between Jesus and the Father and the Spirit of God who is upon him. I ask for the prayerfulness of Christ to rest upon us and that we would embark together on this relational journey in a dimension that is so new, so exciting, so impacting on every part of our life. I pray this for the honor of the name Jesus. Everybody said amen, amen, amen. There we are. Wow, it feels like such a significant night tonight. How many of you are feeling that in the room? Such a timely word. Just it felt like every single person that word was for. We're going to do a fire tunnel tonight, so we're going to have the ministry team come up. So just while the ministry team are coming forward, just take a moment. It feels like we're in such a significant night. I just really want to encourage you. Sometimes we're going to go through a fire tunnel tonight. We often do fire tunnels here. I want you tonight, I feel like there's a, a grace in the room to go through the fire tunnel like it's your first time. Don't get familiar with the fire tonight. Come through the, the fire tunnel expecting God to radically touch you. There's just anointing in the air. It's something in the air tonight. So ministry team are going to come forward. We're going to have two tunnels You'll come down the central aisle, and there'll be a tunnel to your, my, my left and a tunnel to my right. And I will have somebody wonderful from staff, this handsome man, Joel Power. You will split at his right and left. So get into form two lines down the central aisle, two lines down the central aisle. And then we'll have a fire tunnel on my left and a fire tunnel on my right. Staff, if you can just help make sure those tunnels are ready to go. I really feel it though, there's just something in the...